Welcome everyone. In this episode, we are going to talk about screen use among children and adolescents. And we have a great guest for this episode. Our guest has done his master's degree at the University of Bristol in physical activity, nutrition and public health. And his PhD at the University of Southern Queensland, Australia, which focused on understanding contemporary screen use among children and adolescents. Currently, he's working as a postdoctoral researcher, research fellow at Curtin University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Dr. George Thomas. Welcome, George. Thank you very much, Ollie. Great to be here. Great to have you. So would you like to first introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So you did a very nice introduction for me there. So just to extend on that, um, I'm currently working at Curtin University albeit remotely from Queensland, Australia. Um, and it's part of the Centre of Excellence uh, Digital Child Project. So currently working on the Healthy Programme, trying to understand contemporary screen use among younger children. Um, so that's kind of where I'm sat at the moment. Uh, it's a fantastic new opportunity for me that I'm very keen to talk about. Mm, yeah, nice, nice, nice theme. And I think really, really important theme with all the all the smartphones and, and tablets that easily take our yeah, time and children's time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you started your PhD with the, a systematic scoping review. Could you tell about the findings? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so when I came to Australia, I didn't actually have uh, an idea that I would look into contemporary screen use among this uh, younger population, children, adolescents. And it was Stuart Biddle, who was my supervisor at the time. And he was very keen to look into these new patterns of behavior. And we had a discussion, a walk-in meeting, of course, of Stuart, expect nothing less. Um, and we, we just discussed this idea of screen use in, in children and adolescents. And, you know, there's been a, a lot of research into the area. And we felt that there was, there was a real big missing gap in the sense that there wasn't much research looking into more modern screen-based devices, such as your mobile touchscreen devices. So the systematic scope and review was a summary of the evidence of the literature that really just kind of looked at what, what was out there, um, not just mobile touchscreen devices, but traditional screen-based media as well. So it was really just to kind of get a kind of an insight of not only what the devices have, that have been measured, but also the type of measurement that is examined these different devices, um, you know, and just to get a feel of the literature and to see what actually needed to be done in this space. And it turned out there was quite a bit that needed to be done. So it was a fantastic opportunity for me to to get my teeth into. And um, it actually informed the following few studies of, of, my, of my research. So to kind of break it down in terms of key findings, we, we actually found that of 130 surveillance-based studies with a minimum sample size of 5,000 participants, only six of those looked at smartphone devices. So... That was an immediate red flag to us to think, OK, um, there's a lot of literature out there, but typically on these traditional screen based devices, such as TV use, computer use and traditional video game consoles. So that was a that was a first initial finding. And we thought, OK, so we know that there's there's literature, but we need to look into these more modern screen based devices. We need to adapt to the modern reality of contemporary screen use. We also found that the majority, um, in fact, all of the literature was observational um, that used the majority of cross-sectional data with few longitudinal studies. Um, so that, again, was kind of telling to us that we need more research that looked at the longitudinal trends of such use, um, particularly in these newer forms of devices. So there was two key findings there already that kind of informed the first initial stages of the PhD. Um, we also found that all studies used self-report or proxy report measures of screen use. Um, again, we know that whilst this has showed us very good findings and it's provided us with the, the initial foundation of evidence, it is hampered by quite a few biases, as we know, social desirability bias, measurement error. Um, so we know that, again, we have this literature, but it's not informed by the best measurement. It's not informed by the best protocols. So we needed to do something about this. So that informed the later end of the study, which looked at using a more direct form of measurement to measure screen use. And that's where we, we introduced the, the use of wearable cameras, which um, I'm very excited to talk about with you today. Um, we also looked at the patterns of screen use. So we looked at how much or how, how, how many children were exceeding public health guidelines 
of two hours of screen time per day. And that's the guideline for children aged five to 18. Mm. And we found that approximately 52% exceeded those guidelines. Um, so we knew that it was a very prevalent behavior. Mm. So, so basically, if I wrap up a little bit, a lot of studies, but only a few with the modern devices, which is kind of understandable that the fast internet connection in phones haven't been so long and that you could have been actually able to watch videos or, or something from the phone. Of course, yeah, you can do something with the phone <laughs> before also, but not something what children probably would would do too much. And And many were using screens more than the recommendation. Could you tell a little bit more about the findings? What were the ranges of use time? What were the averages and so on in the studies? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we actually managed to distinct these studies that looked at the percentage of or prevalence of behavior. So we looked at the prevalence of those exceeding those guidelines. Um, the majority of studies actually used the threshold of two hours per day. Um, mm. And yet there was 52.3%, I think, of children and adolescents that exceeded those guidelines. But we also looked at studies that actually used uh, time point measures or point based estimates, as we described them in our paper. And it was actually it was quite astonishing. Um, so children and adolescents were averaging a range of around about eight hours of screen time per day. Um, and of course, there was there was variance in these in these studies, but um, as much as eight hours per day, which is quite shocking because, you know, these, these were studies that were looking at just uh, traditional screen based media. We weren't actually accounting for these neuro based screen based devices. So that was quite telling to us that actually, OK, well, if we start looking at these newer forms of devices, is it even more? Has it tapered back? Um, so it provided us with a few nice research questions. Mm. And And did you look at all like different countries is there a difference i think there's a way we we try to school our children or or have have limits did you did you see any differences between countries um interestingly the, the developing countries um or sorry non-developing countries weren't so different um we found that the majority were kind of exceeding public health guidelines um so there wasn't much variation and we thought we might find some actually within those countries but we looked at countries across the usa australia european countries um and we didn't find too much variation in fact we found that the majority of those countries were exceeding public health screen time guidelines so it seems to be a global issue that needs to be attended to hmm. yeah that's that's interesting so so this was informing you you clearly saw that there's there's better studies to be done so how did you how did you start planning planning the next next stages yeah so the next stages were really informed by the systematic scoping review and um what we didn't know was we didn't really understand number one the longitudinal trends of screen-based media use um particularly in newer forms of devices we wanted to find data that actually looked into these measures of smartphone use social networking online messaging these newer forms of behavior and um, we did a little bit of digging and we came across the longitudinal study of Australian children. And this was a data set that provides information on these newer forms of digital media. So we thought this was a good opportunity to look at, you know, what were the trends from um, over a period of four years uh, amongst adolescents? And uh, that was the kind of the, the first stage of following the systematic scoping review. But what we also didn't know was that we didn't really understand the functions or the context of modern screen use. Um, we understand quite a lot about the duration of what's going on, the patterns of use, but very little is known about what are children and adolescents actually doing on these screens and what purpose is actually serving them. Is it beneficial? Is it negative? Um, we simply don't really have much information in that area. It's very understudied. So this informs some interview and qualitative studies and then later the, the wearable camera direct observation studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so not much knowledge how how they use whether it's beneficial. Could you tell a little bit more about what did you find in in this one? If we skip a little bit, I think it's interesting <laughs> what children are actually using those yeah. devices. Absolutely. So um, we we actually managed to recruit uh, some adolescents to talk to them to to interview them individual based studies and. Uh, we, we simply asked them, you know, how are you using your devices? What are you using? Um, and what purpose of that use uh, is it actually for? And we found that there was a number of emerging patterns of screen use. And one of those was multi-screening. So we found that adolescents would often engage in more than one device at the same time. 
Um, and then we, when we kind of dig, dug a little bit deeper in this, we, have, we actually found that it served quite an important social element to their lives. Um, it would allow them to engage with their friends, uh, family, whilst engaging in other forms of screen-based media. Um, so to give you an example, they would often describe watching the TV whilst messaging their friends at the same time to kind of talk about the storyline. Um, and it was quite interesting because there's then it brings up the, the debate whether is it actually beneficial? Is it serving a, an important social function to keep them engaged and connected with their friends and, and family? Um, so this is something which I, I think really needs to be looked at in further um, to really take away from this idea that all screens should be demonized and all screens should be uh, looked at in a, in a poor way, in a, in a bad way. And I actually believe that screens can be potentially beneficial in certain contexts. So this shined light on that debate. And I think it was a really important finding um, for us. We also found that binge watching was an emerging form of screen time, which I can agree, I'm, I'm actually guilty for myself at times. And, um, you know, if you look at Netflix, they make it incredibly easy for us to engage in prolonged periods of screen time. And again, when we dug a little bit deeper and we asked why, um, it often was informed by social elements. You know, these adolescents wanted to feel part of a topic discussion. They wanted to go to school and feel part of a a trend and often that would be from a tv show um, and they didn't want to feel left out there was this almost fear of missing out if they didn't watch the show and it would often mean that many of these adolescents would watch a number of shows in, in concession so again it's the balance between okay what is the physical risk of, of binge watching versus the social potential benefits of screen watching so we need to get that right and i think this is an important future direction of research hmm yeah yeah really really interesting i i don't have a netflix so i don't i don't know about <laughs> how how it's how it's kind of suggesting and uh, suggesting binge watching i've been i've been watching youtube now for for some time and it's it's quite interesting that it's it starts to get better you know you you follow you watch a video it knows what you like yeah. and it gets better and then the suggestion starts to be better and and at least in youtube the kind of the thumbnail they try to make it really interesting. Mm. And then it's basically, what do you need to know today about Omicron? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, maybe I need to know this. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it is really important. It's uh, maybe a question of life and death. Yeah. So so I think it's it's making making like making us and making children it's it's easy to like watch videos and and it might be beneficial, it might be important knowledge. So how did you how did you look this that if they for example binge watch did you did you follow up any way that do they feel actually good about it or do they feel bad about it yeah no it's a great question we we did we asked kind of what were the general perspectives on such use um and typically from a from a physical standpoint um they felt pretty negative about sitting for long periods of time watching a tv show um it didn't necessarily make them feel good um, again, from a physical standpoint, there are often um, there are often kind of descriptions of feeling quite disgusted with themselves um, and feeling quite ashamed of that use. And that was quite interesting because you kind of had one side which was a very negative perception of watching uh, long periods of screen use, but then you had on the other side you had the social importance of such use. So even the adolescents, adolescents themselves didn't quite understand how to get that balance right. Um, some would kind of talk about postural pain um, if it was sitting for long periods of time. But there was a general negative feeling towards doing in terms of engaging in such such use. And I found that quite interesting because at the same time, it was often countered by, well, but actually it's important for me because it allows me to connect with friends. It allows me to message my friends about important TV shows and storylines. So it just kind of highlights the complexity in this space in the sense of, well, what is right? What is the right pattern of use? How do we use screens? You know, how do we get that balance right in the 21st century where there's so much digital media at our fingertips? And, um, you know, we don't want adolescents feeling bad about such use, but we want to do it in a way which allows them to feel okay about it, but not a way that makes them feel things like ashamed and disgusted and, you know, these other potential negative markers that they're, that they're describing. Mm. That, that's really interesting. So so do you think it comes from the social norms of saying that you shouldn't do this or it comes from the feeling bad? Uh, you, you said quite a strong adjective, so it's it's very yeah. interesting. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's probably a bit of both. Um, I think binge watching, when you, when you talk about binge watching, the initial kind of, uh, at least for me, the thought pattern that comes in is that it's bad. It's, it's binging. It's a, uh, it's a negative reinforcing behavior. And I'm sure that, you know, at least the, the descriptions that I was getting from these interviews that adolescents actually feel quite similar to that. So they engage in it knowing that it's potentially negative. They, they engage in it that it's potentially poor uh, for their for their state, but actually they still do it. And this is quite interesting. Is it a habitual? Is there an automated kind of mechanism here that's happening mm-hmm. where they know it's bad, but they, they, they can't quite manage that use? Um, so it's a really, really interesting area and one that I'm quite keen to dig a little bit deeper in and uh, dig my feet into a little bit more um, because it's... It, again, the social norm says that it's bad for us, but actually, what are we missing? Are we are we missing out on some potential benefits of such use? Now, it's a very contentious area, so I, you know, I haven't got any kind of um, any kind of firm findings in that space. But I'm very keen to look into it a bit further and see actually what what is it informed by and what is it giving these adolescents? What is it actually helping them with? Mm, yeah, that's that's interesting. And if if I go back to this multi-screen use. Like, so basically, do you think that it's not concentrating to anything or it's it's a good social action? Did they describe it anyway? Because, yeah, you can go, you can watch a movie with someone who's present there and discuss mm. about the movie and it's still kind of multitasking. You have the movie and you're discussing and is it different with the screen? How, how do you see this? How did the children experience it? So the feeling that I got towards... Um, towards these interviews is that they they often described it as a essential element of their everyday lives um multi-screening or having multiple screens in front of them was simply just there um it was just natural for them to use more than one screen at one time it was a almost a necessity for their everyday lives and um that's a very that's that was quite interesting in itself because if we're trying to influence overall screen time we need to consider that we're not just thinking about one screen now we're considering several devices at the same time in terms of how they experienced that, I think there again was a was a mixture of feelings. Um, some of the social norms again came into it, and it was almost uh, the more devices, the, the worse it would be for their well being. But on the other sense, it was a necessity. They had to have multiple screens so that they can engage with other people, so that they could socially connect with other people. Um, so again, it kind of comes in: is it an automated? Is it a habitual process that we're missing here that needs to be looked at further? Um, you know, I think many people would probably look at multi-screening and think, oh, like panic and go, I'm not too sure about this. This is this is a problem, but it might be a problem. But we need to look at the reality of contemporary screen use in the sense that we have so many more devices than we used to have. So we need to we need to think about that. We need to consider that, yes, it might be poor. It might be beneficial. But the reality of it is that it's happening. Um, and that, you know, the average adolescent has up to four devices um, and we can't get away from that. And we need to kind of consider that moving forward in terms of how we influence overall screen time in the future. Mm, yeah, really, really interesting. Do you have any any other findings to share from this qualitative uh, investigation? Yeah, so the key kind of the key objective in this study was to look at the overall functions of their screen use. And as I've mentioned before, a lot of it was informed by social aspects but we also dug a little bit deeper in terms of the contextual backgrounds of of particular screen use we looked at where they were engaging with types of screens who they were engaging with their screens with and um, interestingly we found that when adolescents engaged in binge watching behaviors they would often retreat into their bedrooms Um, and this was particularly a, a case of just not wanting to be uh, suspicious amongst their family members that they were engaging in such a such a use of binge watching so they would often retreat in a more private setting and comfortable setting to watch more prolonged periods of screen time we did find that in more family settings when it was a more of a family-based activity like watching the tv it would be in the living room so we found that it was very very different in terms of where the device was used but dependent on what device was being used at the time um, so again, you know, we found different environmental areas of the house that seemed a little bit more prominent for certain types of devices. Smartphones appeared to be more prominent in the bedroom areas, whereas TV use, as you'd expect, would be in the living room setting. 
But as we know, smartphones are now used to engage in a number of functions such as TV viewing. So they can now watch TV shows in the comfort of their own rooms, in their privacy of their own rooms. And to me, this kind of brought up an element of, okay, well, what does this mean for kind of a more of a social perspective? You know, they're not spending any time with their family. They're retreating to their bedrooms. What will this mean, you know, in terms of are they connecting with their family? Are they connecting with their siblings and other people? Um, so again, it's a really kind of interesting area that I think needs to be looked into. Mm. And and basically the binge watching happens mostly in bedroom and with the phone. Did you mm. look any musculoskeletal pain? You need to keep the phone somehow. It's very small screen. So I think for me, binge watching from a small screen sounds like a horrible idea. Yeah, and often this is where this is where the the statements came from, and when they were binge watching on their smaller devices, because they would often have to move and adjust their body position, and there was a lot of complaints around that. It was it was affecting their postural um, behaviors. It was affecting their you know their, their positioning, and it would often cause a lot of pain and discomfort. So, but again, they would still do it, and it was it, this was this kept coming through um, that yes, there was a negative, but they would still do it anyway. So the, the the idea that just simply watching the show in their bedroom on a small screen touch device was more important than almost the, the potential consequences of such use. Um, so, you know, it's almost like they're aware that it's potentially bad for them, but they're still going to do it anyway. So I think we really need to dig in a little bit around the automated processes of, of screen use, particularly around binge watching and, and uh, smartphone use. Mm, yeah, I, I think that's really, really interesting. And if we move to the longitudinal study, what what kind of interesting findings you had it in it? Yeah, so I think from the off, we need to state that the findings were from 2010 to 2014. And this was a an immediate limitation of our study. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get later waves of the data simply because it wasn't available. So Already, we recognize that since 2014, a number of newer forms of digital media came to to, to fruition. And uh, we need to recognize that in our findings. But what we did find is that the uh, behavior such as social networking and online communication was on the rise in the period of four years from 2010 to 2014. We found that particularly there were some gender differences. So in boys, we found that video game use increased. Um, quite prominently actually um, which might not be too surprising uh, for for some people but it whereas in girls social networking and online communication seemed to increase a lot more um, so there were some, some important gender differences there which we need to consider for, for future interventions um, we found that TV viewing typically stabilized throughout the four years there wasn't there was an increase but it wasn't as high as social networking and online communication. Um, probably expected in the sense where we have newer digital media coming through from 2010 onwards. Um, you know, if you look at the iPad came out in 2010, it probably made a difference in terms of many adolescents engaging in more online communication based activities. So this really was just important in terms of understanding what the patterns were. Um, but we really wanted that later data to see what's happening in between 2014 and 2020. And this is something which I'm keen to get my teeth into in the, in the coming years. Mm, yeah, in, interesting things. And I, I, I think all the studies we do, they are kind of old very soon yeah. because like, yeah. for example, you have now TikTok, which has, yeah. is more popular than YouTube and the video length is, I think, 60 seconds. or so maybe they made it a little bit longer now, but basically it changes. You can, any moment you have, you can actually watch a video while yeah. earlier it took some time to see the first video, but now you can watch it much faster. How do you see this? Like, uh, you can see Twitter, it's really fast, like short messages. TikTok is really short video. So how do you see this this evolving with the, with the different new social media platforms and video platforms and messaging platforms? How, how do you see this going? Yeah, I think the the more almost the more platforms that we have, the, the more opportunities that younger people are going to have to engage in social media use and uh you know it's that's this is the, one of the biggest challenge in this space is the, the sense that it's always emerging it's it's forever changing so from a measurement standpoint we need to adapt to things like twitter we need to adapt to things like tiktok and newer forms of social media because unfortunately a lot of the the measurement that we have becomes outdated very quickly because it's ever-changing and uh, it doesn't account for 
You know, it might account for Facebook, it might account for Instagram, but what about these newer, more emerging patterns of social media use? Um, typically, they're not accounted for. So in terms of actual patterns of use, um, Twitter is an interesting one. Um, I'm not too sure whether that's particularly prevalent in adolescents or, or children, um, but that hasn't, I certainly haven't looked into that particular social media uh, domain. But TikTok, on the other hand, I think is going through the roof. And I think this is something which can be looked at further. Um, and there needs to be some data and there would be some data into this because it's it's been about for a while now. It's become very prevalent. And I think we need to kind of discover what kind of use or what kind of patterns of use that children are engaging this with. And how do they engage with TikTok? Um, are they simply watching TikTok videos? But are they actually creating videos and what does this mean for them what function does this serve and you know it's with twitter it's a very much uh more single roaded social media platform you write a tweet you look at tweets tiktok very much more creative more opportunity mm. to be creative more opportunity to actually engage cognitively um mm. so the, the, the differences with regards to well-being might be very different across different social media platforms. And again, this is something which we need to, to, to look at and to see what are the differences and what does this mean for young people's health? Mm. I, I, th I think that's, a, that's an important point that if you think from, a, from many perspectives, if you are creating a video, you are shooting a video, you are editing it, you are adding special effects. I think that's a, mm. that's a quite important task to learn for your mm. future life and it, it teaches you many things it, it's uh yeah compared to that you you watch some some silly videos for example from youtube yeah it's uh it's this argument between passive media passive screen based use and active screen based use and are we actively engaging in, in the screen are we actively engaging in the content or are we just simply scrolling and just passively getting through it And I, you know, I, I, th I think there would be some some key differences in terms of what it's doing for our young people, and what function that's serving, um, particularly long term uh, effects as well. So yeah, it's it's th this is the this is where I always say, are screens good or bad? I'm not sure. It's complex and it really depends. And this will this will be the the case. And I think we need to really consider a number of elements when we start to go into that debate. Um, I love the debate, but it's a very complex debate and we need to consider all these different nuances as we're talking about now. Yeah. And and have you been looking passive versus active use uh, in, in any way in your studies? Um, we we did ask around this in the interviews. So we, we talked a little bit about the type of use and uh, whether if it was passive or if it was a background activity. Um, it came up a lot in uh, the multi-screen discussion. So often adolescents would be engaging in a primary screen but then they would also be engaged in more passive use through the TV in the background. And, you know, we looked at well, why, what were the reasons for that? And again, typically it was just a, a case of switching between the two. Um, we didn't look at potentially the, the, the health impacts of that, but we looked at the reasons why. And um, again, it was often a, a way of just switching between the two and always having a screen-based device there handy. Um, you know, if I give you an example, the, the TV might be on in the background whilst an advert was playing, but the screen, the smartphone would be used in the meantime to keep them engaged, to keep them entertained um, from, a, from a recreational perspective. So it was almost that a screen had to be there, any screen, um, during kind of lower or during advert breaks. You know, they had to be engaged. Um, if it wasn't the TV show, it'd be through social media. And then once the TV show returned, it was straight back into the TV. So you've kind of got this consistent kind of exchange between devices and um yeah it's it's very very interesting very interesting yeah yeah and and then if we move to this uh your study with the wearable cameras could you tell mm. more about those studies or that yeah study? absolutely I'm, i'm always very excited to talk about wearable cameras it's my little uh my little baby if you like it's um what i what i found in the scope and review as we've talked about that All the literature was from self-report proxy report um, from from a surveillance based study standpoint. And, you know, we wanted to to figure out, okay, well, how can we improve measurement of screen use and screen exposure? Not simply just by the types of devices being used, but let's understand the context and the, the content being viewed and how might we do this? And 
this was a this was a thought that came about and we, we looked a little bit into the use of wearable cameras um, there's a lot of really great researchers in this space that have done some research into adults um, and other behaviors such as physical activity uh, dietary behaviors some sedentary behavior behaviors as well um, and you know, we thought, okay, well, let's see if we can utilize these cameras in a, in a younger population, understand screen exposure in adolescents. And uh, there were a few protocols floating about at the time, and we looked a little bit about it. But immediately, the first kind of issue that was raised was ethical. You know, what were the ethical challenges with using wearable cameras in this population? And it probably explains why not many studies have been done that utilize such device. And uh, if I'm honest, I could probably write a PhD on the ethical challenges alone from wearable cameras. It was a challenge. Um, you know, I navigated an ethics application over the course of 12 months, 12, 13 months, and it was fascinating. It was fascinating hearing the perspectives from not just the children and adolescents, but from third parties, you know, parents, uh, professors, um, school principals. You know, what were the concerns and what might the challenges that will be raised in the study? And we had a number of consultations with a number of different populations. And we really wanted to do that initial formative research before we put in this ethics application. And we put a lot of time in and, you know, there's a lot of issues with using cameras in children alone. Um, but when you start to try and use those in school settings, um, you've got a number of other issues that get raised. And unfortunately, we couldn't pass the ethics to use these cameras in schools, but we did manage to use them in free living conditions in the home and outside of the home environment. Um, so we, we, sh we made sure we strictly adhered to the ethical guidelines from Paul Kelly, um, who was a fantastic uh, support for us in terms of helping us understand what those issues might be. Um, and you know, we, we made sure that we were explicit from the start about what we were going to do. And this was this was a, just, a, as I say, it was I could write a PhD alone on the ethical challenges. And um, I'm, I was really excited about using these cameras. Mm. But we got it. We got we got it through. And, um, you know, it allowed us to to use a more direct measurement of screen use. And it provided us with, with great information and, you know, uh, more information that we might be able to get through a self-report proxy report questionnaire. Um, and it was a huge benefit for our study. So those are the kind of the initial challenges that we were faced with. Mm. And could you tell a little bit more about the cameras? Are they still cameras or video and how, how they were positioned and for how long? Yeah, absolutely. So the camera that we used um, was a camera which was chest mounted on a harness. Um, and the kind of the mechanical um, elements to it, it was a very small camera, very lightweight. Um, it took, it, it could take video, but we managed it so it took a picture every 10 seconds. So it had an epoch of 10 seconds. We made this decision based on a number of factors. Um, the first kind of factor was battery capacity. You know, if it took a picture every second or so, then we simply wouldn't have enough capacity over the course of data collection. We did consider using a shorter epoch because, of course, with screen use, a lot can happen in five, 10 seconds. You know, it might be a smartphone checking notification. Um, but we went with 10 seconds based on um, what had previously been done in the sense that we think we could have collected enough information or accurate information of what was going on. Uh, we made sure that the uh, the camera was was safe and it protected privacy. So we encrypted the SD card inside of the camera to ensure that if it did become lost, it wouldn't be uh, picked up by a stranger in, and used to access those images. So that was a very important part of the ethics application to satisfy their needs, to ensure that the SD card was encrypted. Um, and it was a very wide angled lens. And this was key for us in terms of picking up contextual information. So we made sure that we had a wide angle, I think it was 110 field of view. So not only did we capture the device, we captured who was using the screens at the same time, what environment was it being engaged in. Um, if there was a multi-screen and it was a TV in the background, we could actually collect that information. So this was very important for, my, for us in terms of choosing the camera. Um, so yeah, those were the kind of the key practical things that we, we looked at and, and the decisions that we we kind of considered in terms of what camera we should choose. Um, but it was, we try to make sure it was less intrusive as possible. Um, it is difficult, very, very difficult to do, but we tried to ensure that we did as much as we could to, to ensure that the adolescents felt comfortable wearing these cameras. They were wearing them from school periods, uh, sorry, after school periods toward bedtime. So we needed to make sure it was, it was comfortable for them as well. Hmm. Yeah. So, so if we stay a little bit more with the ethical things, like mm. 
uh, you encrypted, was it automatically done with the camera or did you need to develop it by yourself that it's encrypted there? Yeah, so we actually had to make sure that the SD card was encrypted manually from us. The camera wasn't automatically encrypted. So we needed to make sure that, it, again, if the, if the SD card became uh, available, then they wouldn't be able to access that. It would be encrypted with a password. Um, mm. So that was one of the, the kind of the, one of the things we put in place to ensure the privacy uh, of images. Uh, a very key factor, a uh, very key decision that we made was to provide participants and their parents the opportunity to review and delete any images before uh, I had access to them or any other research team member had access to them. So um, we invited those in and we invited the parents in to actually just look at the images and they were given a time diary during data collection that if they forgot to take the camera off during certain periods of time, then they could go straight to those images, delete them, and then we would obviously have access to them following that. So this was this was quite a good good thing to put in place and something we found that parents really liked um, to ensure that, okay, let, let's be honest, they might forget to take the camera off in certain periods, um, go into the bathroom, get in unchanged. You know, these are some examples that came up and it just provided them with the comfort and uh, autonomy to delete those images if needed. Um, so this was, this was key. Mm. So... 10 second epoch that's quite many images <laughs> how long was the measurement time oh it was it was a lot of images so i actually captured 75000 images and and actually relatively compared to the other projects such as the kids cam study it's very little but for me it seemed like a huge amount um so uh, over the course of uh, we had 30 weekday evenings and 10 full weekend days so a total of 75 approximately 75000 images to code and uh, they were all manually coded um, by myself. <laughs> I was very <laughs> I was very lucky at the time because I was stuck in the UK during lockdown, um, and there wasn't much to do apart from code images. Um, so it was very burdensome. It was very tedious at times, but it, it, taking a positive aspect to it, it was actually it allowed me to get really deep into the data to see what was going on. Um, you know, I, I got to see from every image, you know, you had all this information and I really got to learn about what adolescents were doing during these times um, with regards to their screen use. So very tedious, but incredibly useful and insightful as well. Yeah. So 75,000 per participant and how many participants you had? So it's 75,000 images across the participants. Um, all right. So yeah. per participant, it was approximately 8,000 images per participant. Um, All right. Which might not seem a lot, but um, when you've got a code for about, well, you've got to annotate seven different components of each image, it can take a while. Um, you know, as I said, we're coding not just for the device, we're, we coded for the content being viewed, we, we coded for the social environment, the physical environment, uh, the temporal patterning of those images, when were they, what, what time of the day. So this was a challenge um, from just simply a mechanical, practical perspective, it was, it was quite challenging. 